Okay, you can start. All right, all right. Hello, Ruby Turkey. My name is Peter Zhu. I'm a Ruby core committer and a production engineer at Shopify working on Ruby. It is my pleasure today to be giving a talk called a Rubyist walk along the seaside about Ruby C extensions. In this presentation, we will look at how to set up and use the Ruby C API. For this presentation, you're expected to be familiar with Ruby and have a basic understanding of C. If you want to follow along or build C extensions on your computer, you should have Make installed, as well as a C compiler such as GCC or Clang. So why are C extensions used? One reason is for performance. It's not a secret that Ruby is not very fast. So by implementing performance critical code in C, we can significantly improve performance. Examples of gems that require high performance include Puma, which needs to serve web requests fast, Liquid C, which is used to speed up the execution of Liquid templates, and Bcrypt, which is used to compute hashes. We can also use C extensions to call C libraries. Examples of gems that use C libraries include Nokogiri, which uses libxml2, and MySQL2, which uses libmysql client. We could also use FFI to call C functions directly from Ruby, but I won't be covering this method today. For this talk, we'll build a circular iterator. The circular iterator will take a Ruby array in its constructor and have a single method called next, which will return the current element and move on to the next. When this iterator reaches the end of the array, we loop back and start from the beginning again. Here we see an illustration of the circular iterator for an array of three elements. We start at the beginning of the array. When the next method is called, the, the cursor moves to the next element in the array. We can call the next method again to move to the next element in the array. Now that we're at the end of the array, we can call next again, so then we loop back to the start of the array. Let's create test.rb where we will test our circular iterator. We will create an array of three elements and our circular iterator. We can see that every time we call next, we get the next element of the array and loop back when we reach the end. Let's now implement a reference solution in Ruby in the file circulariterator.rb. We'll define the class circular iterator. We can then define the initialize method that accepts the array and stores it in an instance variable and we set the index instance variable to zero. We then define the method next that will read the current element and move to the next index. However, we must make sure that we don't read past the end of the array so we modulo it against the array length. We return the element at the cursor at the end. We now load this implementation in our test script. We can run our test script in the terminal and see the expected output. By convention, let's write our C extension in a directory called ext. We'll write the code in a file called circulariterator.c. We first include the header files for Ruby. This is how we'll be able to use the Ruby C API in our C extension. We then define a function called init circular iterator that returns void, which is nothing, and accept void, which is also nothing. The name of this function is important as it's the function that Ruby will call when we load our C extension. The name of this function must be init with a capital I followed by the extension name, which is circular iterator for us. We then use the rbdefine class function to create a Ruby class called circular iterator C with a superclass of object. You will see the value type here very often and it is the type used to represent Ruby objects in the C API. Let's then define the function initialize. We'll use rbdefine method for this, which accepts the class or module we are defining the method on, the name of the method, the C function that will implement the method, which we will implement soon, and the number of arguments. Our initialized method will have one argument, which is the array that we pass in. Let's also define the method called next. This method accepts no arguments, so we pass zero here. Let's define the initialize method. The first argument will always be self, which is the Ruby object that we are calling this method on. And we have one extra argument, which is used to pass the array. We can now call rbiv set to set an instance variable on our object. rbiv set accepts three arguments. 
First is the object that we are setting this value on. The second is the instance variable name. And the last argument is the value we're setting it to. Here, we set the instance variable for array. We will now set the instance variable index to be the number zero. We must first convert the C number zero into a Ruby fixed number. If you recall fixed num from Ruby 2.3 and earlier, it is the type used to represent relatively small numbers efficiently. Since Ruby 2.4, we no longer differentiate fixed nums and big nums, as they have been merged into a single type called integer. However, these two types are still distinct in the C API. Since the initialized method isn't supposed to return anything, we return the Ruby value nil here. Q nil, along with Q true and Q false, are value that the Ruby API provides for us for Ruby's nil, true, and false values respectively. Now let's implement the next method. This method accepts no arguments, so our C implementation will only accept the self object. Here we get the array object from the instance variable using rbiv get. We use our array pointer to get the C array that backs the Ruby array. Since the Ruby array contains an array of Ruby objects, we get a pointer to an array of value types. We now read the index instance variable with rbiv get and convert it from a fixed num back to a C long using fixed to long. We can now read the element at the particular index. Since we have the C array that backs the Ruby array, we can directly read the memory region using C array notation. We now increment the index. Just like how we used our array pointer to get the pointer to the array, we use our array len to get the length of the array. Now we can update the index instance variable with the new index. But before we do that, we need to convert our C long back into a Ruby fix num using long to fix. We conclude this function by returning the element. Let's recap what we've done. In our entry point function called init circular iterator, we define a class called circular iterator C and two methods initialize and next on this class. We then implemented the initialize method, which sets the array and index instance variables. We then implemented the next method, which first retrieves the array instance variable and gets the C array that backs that Ruby array. We also load the index instance variable and convert it from a Ruby fix num to a C long. We retrieve that Ruby object from the particular index in the array. We then increment the index and modulo it against the array length to loop back when we reach the end. We then set the index instance variable by converting the C long back into a Ruby fix now. At the end, we return the element at the index we were at. The return value of the C function is what is returned as the return value of the Ruby method. Before we can use our C extension, we must build it properly. We'll write a Ruby script called xconf.rb and use a built-in library called mkmf or make makefile that will help us create the makefile required to build the C extension. We can simply call create makefile with the C extension name to generate the makefile. We'll call our C extension circular iterator. It's important that this name matches our C source file name and the name of the init function we wrote in it. Here we run our xconf.rb Ruby script to generate the make file. We then run make to build our C extension. We now have a compiled binary that is our C extension. Let's now update our original implementation to be called circular iterator Ruby. We'll also update the test script with the new class name. Let's verify that we have not made any mistakes and that it still works. Let's now test our C implementation. You've probably used require and require relative to load other Ruby files, but did you know they can also be used to load compiled C extensions too? We see the expected output using the C implementation. Let's write a benchmark to compare the two implementations. We'll be using benchmark IPS, which will give us the number of iterations per second of each implementation. 
we'll use an inline gem file to install the gem. We'll now load the two implementations. For the benchmark, we'll be using a reasonably large array of a thousand elements and we'll fill the array with integers. We'll now initialize the two circular iterators. We'll now use benchmark IPS to compute the number of full iterations we can do for each iterator. Benchmark IPS will report the number of times the block can be executed per second. So of course, the higher the number, the better it is. We'll benchmark both the Ruby and C implementations. Let's now run the benchmark. Hmm, why is the C implementation almost 70% slower than the Ruby version? Peter, you might say, are you lying to us? I thought you said C is faster than Ruby. Let's look at all the places that we call into Ruby in the next method in the C extension. There are seven places where we call into Ruby. Since our goal of writing a C extension is to rely on Ruby less, we're defeating the purpose here, which is one of the reasons why it's significantly slower than the Ruby implementation. Let's now implement a more optimized implementation. Let's rename the current implementation to x to ivar since it uses instance variables. We'll update the class name in the C extension, in our test script, and in our benchmark script. Don't forget to rebuild the extension after we have modified it. Let's now create a new implementation called xstruct since we'll be using cstructs to implement it. Let's copy over our implementation with instance variables and rename it to struct. Let's also delete all implementation code and update the class name to circular iterator cstruct. We'll first define a struct called circular iterator that will hold the data we need. It will store the array object and the index we are currently at. We now need to set up a RB data type T, which will hold information Ruby needs to know about our type. We'll create a global variable called circular iterator data type and we'll initialize it. We store the name in the first element, which we call circular iterator. We then need to pass two functions, a mark function and a free function. The mark function will be the function Ruby uses when it needs to know what objects we are holding onto and should not be swept and reclaimed by the garbage collector. The free function will be the function Ruby's garbage collector uses to free this object when it's unreachable. We'll be using the default free function since we won't be allocating anything extra so we don't need to clean anything up. Let's implement the mark function. We are passed in a void pointer which is the pointer to our struct which we can cast it into our circular iterator struct. The only Ruby object we will be holding is the array. We need to mark it so Ruby does not reclaim and free the memory. If we did not mark it, then our code could be buggy, since if Ruby reclaimed this array, we would have a broken object, or if Ruby reused this memory for another object, we would use a different object than what we expect. We need to define an allocation function for our class. This will be called when an object needs to be created but before the initialize method is called. We'll use rb-define-alloc-func, which accepts the class we are defining the allocation function on and the function that implements the allocation. Let's now implement the allocation function we just defined. The allocation function must accept one argument for the class of the object and return the allocated object of this class. In our case, the class argument will always be circular iterator C struct class, but it will not be true if an instance of a subclass was created. We'll create an instance of this class by calling typed data make struct. Type data is a type of object that allocates and holds a pointer to a piece of memory that you can access via the C API. But in Ruby code, this type will appear to behave the same as a regular Ruby object. We pass the class we are creating an instance of in the first argument, followed by the struct we are allocating in the second argument. We pass our previously created RB data type T for this type in the third argument, and we'll pass a pointer to our struct that will be updated to point to the circular iterator struct allocated for this object. 
we return the object that we allocated at the end. Now, in our initialize method, we'll get the circular iterator struct from the object using type data get struct. Remember, we allocate this object along with the struct in our allocate function we just implemented. We pass the object in the first argument, a struct data type in the second argument, the RB data type T for this type in the third argument, and we'll pass a pointer to our struct that will be updated to point to the circular iterator struct for this object. Once we have the struct, we can initialize its values for the array and index. Finally, our initialize method returns nil. We'll now implement the next method. Once again, we'll get a pointer to the circular iterator struct from the object using type data get struct. We can now get the array object directly from the struct without reading any instance variables. Once again, we get the pointer to the C array that backs our Ruby array and get the element at our current index. We now need to set the new index. Since we're storing this data directly as a C long, we no longer need to perform casting to and from Ruby fixed nums. Finally, we return the element, which will be the value returned from the Ruby method. Let's recap what we've done. In our entry point function init circular iterator, we've created the class circular iterator C struct and defined an allocate function and the initialize and next methods. Starting from the top of the file, we have the C struct that holds the data for the array and index, which were stored in an instance variable in the previous implementation. We then define a RB data type T global constant that holds information about our object type, including the name, the marking function, and the freeing function. We implement the mark function that when called, marks our array since it's the only Ruby object we're holding onto. We then implemented the allocate function. The allocate function is called before initialize and is called when the object needs to be created but before any memory has been allocated. We use type data make struct to make a type data object with the circular iterator struct. We then implemented the initialize method. Here we get the circular iterator struct from the object and initialize the array and index attributes. We then implemented the next method. Again, we get the circular iterator struct from the object. We can then get the array from the struct. We get the C array that backs the Ruby array and get the element at the current index. We then increment the index and modulo it against the array length. We then return the element at the index at the end. Since we already ran xconf.rb and we have a make file generated previously, we can use it and build again. Let's see if our C struct implementation works. Let's edit test.rb and use the struct implementation. Let's run test.rb and see if we get the correct output. Hooray! We can see that the C struct implementation is working properly. Let's update the benchmark script and also benchmark the C struct implementation. Again, we'll load our C extension, create a new instance of it, and add an entry to benchmark IPS. Let's run the benchmark again. Indeed, we see that the C implementation using structs is almost 40% faster than Ruby. Here we see the benchmark results again in the plot. Once again, we see that the IVAR instance variable implementation is significantly slower than our Ruby implementation. We can also see that our C struct implementation is faster than Ruby. As an exercise for you, the viewer, is to try to optimize the C struct implementation. With some simple optimizations, I was able to get about 5% more performance. We have reached the end of the talk. I hope you learned a little about how to set up and write Ruby C extensions, and I hope this has sparked some interest in learning the C API. You can access all of the source code in this talk in this GitHub repository. I'm writing a series called A Rubyist Walk Along the Seaside that goes more in depth into the Ruby C API. 
The first three parts are available, and more will be available as I continue to write them. Feel free to follow me on Twitter, my handle is peterzoot118. If you want to reach out, feel free to also email me. Thank you very much for listening to my talk today. If you have any questions or comments, my future self will be here to answer them. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all for listening. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Peter. Can you share uh, the GitHub link on the chat? Yeah. Uh, so I actually realized I forgot to push it onto GitHub. So I still need to do that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but it will be available very shortly. No problem. Okay. There's. Yashar has shared something. Yeah, I already did it. Yashar is a human OCR. <laughs> Turkish need şey vardı Amazon. Automated Turk. Automated Turk. <laughs> Okay, um, Peter Mohammed is saying uh, an, an optimization that he's thinking about maybe array length being stored in the struct so that it doesn't need to be looked up every time. And he says right the blog, blog trees are awesome. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes, um, I encourage you to try to play around. Um, there's a wide variety of things you can do uh, that, that will, speed things up, um, maybe storing the, the array length in the struct is one of them. Give it a shot. But how can we be sure that the array doesn't change on this? You, the, the, there's some assumptions you have to make. Right. Um, like for example, this, this implementation doesn't work if the array is empty. Um, it will try to it will try to read index zero, which is actually non-existent, um, right. yeah. which is actually kind of problematic in C. Uh, but there's certain assumptions that you can make, and uh, and you know what? Maybe as a challenge, you can try to handle that case where uh, the length is zero. I have a few questions. Um, can we actually store the C array data inside the struct instead of storing the array value? Uh, Is that safe? Yes, yes, if the array never gets resized. If you don't add or remove anything from the array, yes. Right. Um, or change enough. or update any of the elements, I guess. You can store a pointer and that would be safe because it, it, it doesn't get moved. Like the mem like the memory won't get freed, it won't move. So uh, if, if you update, that's fine. If you add or remove, then it's not safe. Okay. I also noticed that your benchmark code is never exercising the loop around. It is, is it? because uh, because uh, Oh, it's the on the same object. Right, but you're only calling it um, the number of times that it has elements. <coughs> Sorry. Yes, but benchmark IPS, you know, for like the Ruby version was running at like 4,000 times. So it was running, it's calling next oh. on the exact same object. So it's right, not creating right, right. a new one. Oh, okay, okay, I get it. Yes, true. Unless someone has, has a question, I have another question. Um, I'm a little bit confused by the typed make, um, type data make struct thing. Yeah. Um, so you give it a pointer that's not initialized and then, right? And then it 
updates the pointer? Yes, it's a macro. Oh, it's a okay. macro and it will, it will, so instead of giving a pointer to the pointer, yeah, it will actually okay. update the pointer itself because it will, because it's a macro. So it will, at that line, the, the C preprocessor will actually replace it with the correct code. You can see me shaking my head, right? Like, it's You're right. so it's confusing. It's, it's very so confusing. confusing. Which is why, uh, which is why it's so difficult to get into the like, the C API part of Ruby because it's it's very confusing. Um, there's very little documentation, um, and it's extremely verbose, as you can tell. Um, and and if you if you make any small mistakes, such as you know your your mark function is, you forget to mark something inside the mark function, you can have very subtle bugs inside of your code. Um, so there's a there's a relatively high uh, it's a very high learning curve and so which is why if you read my blog post it will say you probably shouldn't write C extensions unless you you absolutely have to. Peter, you include uh, Ruby H header file in C files. Where is it? Oh, uh, so the ruby.h header file is uh, is built along with Ruby when you install Ruby. Okay. Um, and, and where it is... Um, it is in the Ruby. Yeah, well, All you right. actually don't know, which is why you need to use MKMF. Hmm. MKMF will set the correct paths so then you can load the correct ruby.h uh, when you have, you know, like multiple rubies, when you have like Ruby 2.7 installed, Ruby 3.0 installed. Um, when you use MKMF, it will generate the correct make file uh, with all the directories that are correct and it will load the correct ruby.h file. I see. How to debug memory leaks in C implemented uh, Ruby libraries. Um, so there's there's like two kinds of memory leaks, I guess, um, when you're writing C extensions. One is you leak a Ruby object. So you're holding on to a Ruby object that you don't need. Um, that one, um, you can use Ruby tools to, to help you debug, uh, like trace points. So you can figure out um, when you're, when the, 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 like if, if you're growing in terms of number of Ruby objects and not going down, even though you're not actually using any of those. Um, so, the, but then if you have like C uh, memory leaks, uh, when you call things like malloc, when you allocate memory, then you would use uh, C tools again, such as uh, bell grind and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so there's, there's more possibility of memory leaks now because you have you have basically two types of memory. You have Ruby memory and you have C memory, uh, and you have to make sure you don't leak in both places. I think I know what Mohammed is actually specifically interested in. I think it's um, protobuf and gRPC, but we have the same problem and we don't know. So. Bu arada başka sorusu olan varsa ve Türkçe sormak isterse isterseniz çeviri de yapabilirim. What is my favorite gem? Rails. Well, if if you couldn't <laughs> if you couldn't say rails except rails. Ah. Uh, or any of the gems that are under rails. Device. So, I know which one he's going to say, right, Peter? Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's like ice yeah. cream. No, not no kugiri. No, no kugiri. It's been causing me a lot of problems. Um, 
but Nokogiri is a pretty good gem when it works. Uh, uh, I'm a pretty big fan of, you know, like mini test. I think it's simple to use. To, and you should write tests for your code. So it's, it's encouraging good practices. So what do you think about R spec in that way? I'm not a big fan of R spec because it's, I find it's too complex for a testing library. Like it's, I think tests shouldn't be very dry. And I think R spec makes it too dry. Like dry as in like, don't repeat yourself uh, and making code short and, and reusing things too much. Um, whereas I think tests should be very verbose and you know, it's fine if it's long. I have a question. Uh, when we compare the Ruby implementation and C implementation, we are seeing this like performance improvement, right? Uh, C implementation is faster. But I was wondering where that performance improvement is coming from. Like what is different that makes a struct implementation faster than Ruby's its own implementation. Right. So, um, so Ruby's instance variables are pretty much stored in, in, in uh, hash tables. So you can think of them as like giant hashes, Ruby hashes. And um, that has a kind of a lookup. Uh, it takes time to look that up because it's not a direct memory address. It has to convert uh, the, the instance variable name, such as you know index or array, into an a numeric value to look up um, inside the inside the inside the hash. Um, whereas in our struct implementation, what we're doing is we have a piece of memory that our object directly points to, and when we when we use uh, type data get struct, we read this pointer and directly get the struct of the memory uh into our code so then we don't do any sort of lookups inside hash tables um and then we can just directly read from the memory rather than looking things up uh if that makes sense yeah definitely makes sense so knowing where to look is making the like the gain improvement in the, in terms of the performance yeah, that's one of the reasons. And another reason um, is when we call frequently to and from Ruby inside our C code, um, our C compiler doesn't know what to expect. And so it's hard for the C compiler to do tricks and optimizations that can possibly make our generated uh, machine code smaller. And so if we write more of it in C and call less into Ruby, those parts, um, the C compiler can actually optimize more because it has more context and understands when you do like addition, when you do uh, modulo, like those kinds of stuff, it, it, it knows certain things about your code and it can optimize more. I see. So I just want another question. In, in circular iterator C or other C files, in the circle iterator initialize method, you return Q nil. Why? Because it should be void method, I, I guess. So, <laughs> because so unfortunately, every Ruby method has to return something. Mm. So so even in your initialized it's a method, C method, sorry, it is C. It's not Ruby. Yeah, but you're implementing a Ruby method using C, mm -hmm. and when when you write a Ruby method in Ruby, every method returns something. It returns the 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 like even if you don't say return, it will return the last thing. It's the same thing here. You have to return something, and in in in. The initialized method, it actually doesn't matter what you return because you know in Ruby, you know that if you return anything from initialize, it just gets discarded. 
it's the same thing here. You have, but because the C compiler uh, requires a, a return value, you must return something. So you can return anything you want. And by convention, you just return nil. It's a, it's a simple, straightforward thing to return. Um, I have one more question. Go ahead. Um, in circular iterator next method, do we have to use our array len method to, to calculate the length of the array? Can't we use like any method from C itself? So, so we got the uh, region of memory from the from the Ruby array, but the region of memory we got might actually be larger than the number of elements because um, one of the one of the theories in computer science is that, and and this is used in almost every language, is when we want to resize an array, we actually double the capacity. So you might start off with let's say capacity three. And then let's say you add the fourth element, then you will have enough space to actually store six elements. And then when you want to store the seventh element, it will double again and you will have enough space to store 12 elements. So the memory uh, region might actually be much larger than, um, than, uh, that, than what is actually in the Ruby array. And, th and the, the empty space there, it could be anything. It's, it's just whatever was there left before by whoever was using it before. And so um, we, need to, we need to get the, the array length from Ruby. We need to let Ruby tell us what the length of the array is. So we know how much to read and, how, and when to stop. If we assume array will not change in terms of the length, then, then maybe it can work, right? Yes. Yes, uh, if we assume that the, the array length doesn't change, then we can uh, put that value in the struct instead and read it only in the initialized method. Can I ask another question? Please. Um, what would happen if we initialize the, our struct in initialize and not allocate? We are initializing our struct and initialize, uh, but you can do it in either in either spot, except for objects that you need to pass in. Uh, then you would need to initialize it in initialize and not in allocate. Oh, I mean, sorry, um, making the struct itself. So you know uh, when because you make the struct in allocate and then you get the struct in initialize. I would assume it would save a few cycles if we could just make the struct and use it in initialize. We can't actually do that because the initialize is an instance variable on uh, instance method on the on the object. Right. Whereas initialize is like uh, whereas allocate is like the uh, like I think Ruby also has an allocate uh, or a dot new me uh, class mm -hmm. method. Mm -hmm. It's like that. Um, it's called before any memory has been allocated. And that's where you allocate the memory itself. And that's why you have to return the object in allocate that you created, because that's the object that will be used for the allocation. Right, okay, makes sense. And you're passing in the class there as well. Yes, that will be the, uh, hmm. the, the, the Ruby object that is the class that we have to create, um, which, could be different uh, if if we if we were creating a subclass of C of circular iterator C struct. Makes sense. Um, I have one more question. Uh, yes. This is also related to the performance again. Uh, we saw that like the performance is not drastically improving. It is an improvement, but not like drastic. So I'm wondering uh, at Shopify, do you have any scenario that still like considering this improvement is uh, still like 
provides you enough performance boost on any of like, I don't know, endpoint, it can be your any method, any class. So you have to implement it in C. Yeah, so open source, Liquid C. Um, so if you've used Liquid, uh, if you use like Jenko templates, if you use Shopify itself and you write Liquid, um, uh, so there's a Ruby implementation called Liquid and there's a C implementation called Liquid C. Um, Liquid, so it's a, it's a templating language. It's, it's, like, it's sort of like uh, PHP or ERB, except, it's, um, except unlike ERB, it's actually safe. So you can run untrusted things inside of it. Um, and there's a Ruby implementation in, uh, called Liquid. It's an open source gem. Uh, and there's a, there's a gem called Liquid C that goes on top of Liquid that writes the most, uh, the most like the most performance critical code in C. Uh, and so it, it gives a major speed up to, to executing Liquid, Liquid templates. Um, and, and yeah, and because Liquid templates is what we use to, to generate the storefront, like the, the HTML that you see when you go onto a shop. Um, so it has to be generated very, very fast. So that, that's where C is very helpful in actually perform, giving us the, the performance improvement that we need. Do you know how much faster it is with the C implementation compared to the Ruby implementation? If I recall correctly, the benchmark is like somewhere around two to three X, I think. Okay. It makes uh, a big difference there then. It makes a very big difference, yeah. There is yes. a question in there, but I ask Ufuk on DM of all the same sure. question. <laughs> and also Peter is very on brand today because he's also wearing the Shopify hoodie. Uh, <laughs> right. Peter, you work with Fuku? Yes. Uh, the same thing. That's why I thought your favorite gem was going to be tapioca, Peter, but <laughs> apparently it isn't. No, because I'm not a big fan of sorbet. I, uh, Ruby's gonna <gasps> be untyped. No types, no types. No types, well, I gotta do, I gotta write my buggy code. Got to, got to put anything in there, you know. You can you, you you can't force me to write a put it like a certain type inside of a method. No, 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 no. I I can put anything I want. <laughs> and then you go and put in typed data in your C extension. Okay, I see. Are there any other questions? apart from the Shopify flag. Okay, someone's asking how old you are. Ooh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you have to guess. I won't tell you, I, I will say if you're right or wrong, but you have to guess. No, that's not right. <laughs> I guess it's, it's uh, 22 or 24 or something. 23 is closer. 22. Keep trying, guys. No, 27 is too far. No, uh, 21 is very close. Oh, 34. 18? <laughs> I am 20. Oh, it's very younger. Follow up question. How, how, how tall are you? <laughs> uh, I am 193 centimeters. Yeah. 93. Yeah. yeah. Um, Peter, is it your day-to-day uh, -day job to write like C extensions 
No, or... I, I write Ruby itself. So I'm a, I'm a Ruby core committer. Uh, and most of the times I'm working on, um, I'm working on various things in Ruby. Uh, but I have worked with C extensions before. I worked on Liquid C for a while, uh, a few months ago. Um, yeah, so I write I write more C than than I write Ruby now, even though the C is for Ruby. So that we can write more Ruby and it can run faster, I guess. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So Thank so you, you have to write less C. I write more C, so you have to write less C. Do you, do you, are you playing something to speaking about Ruby or C in RubyConf or RailsConf? I don't know, maybe RubyConf is better than Rails. Yeah, um, I, I'd love to, to, to talk more about uh, Ruby C extensions uh, or about like, Ruby Eternals, how Ruby works on the inside. Um, I think it's it's a very interesting topic that not many people know a lot about. Um, yeah. Have you played with other implementations like Truffle or Ruby News? No, I haven't. But I know, like, I work. People on my team work on Truffle Ruby. Um, yeah, and I think they have a little easier time because they, they're writing in Java and not in C. <laughs> um, yeah, but they're, they're, they're all very talented people and, and yeah, Truffle Ruby is a very interesting implementation as well. What uh, production engineer means? at Shopify, like as a role? I don't actually know. Ufuk, do you know? <laughs> I, I guess. <laughs> okay. She'll say yeah, something. Yeah, I, I can explain that. Um, so currently our team is actually not within production engineering inside of Shopify, but production engineering um, is the part of engineering that's specializing in the operations part. So it's usually the role that in other companies is called SRE, um, System Reliability Engineers. So basically um, production engineers are responsible for making our um, codes um, to run faster uh, and scale bigger. So they make sure that our databases scale, the, uh, our Kubernetes clusters scale and all the infrastructure and everything. See, I don't know that because I don't do any of that. You make Ruby scale, so. When site uh, goes down, is it your responsibility as well? No. That is the cool part then. <laughs> what do you think about like the uh, just-in-time completion, like but specifically for Rails? Do you see any like big, like a really major gains in foreseeable future, or is that like at least a couple of years later? Rails is a bit harder because Rails does a lot of meta programming and and it's a like it uses a lot of features of Ruby. Um, but I I, I think um, like just-in-time compilers will help a lot um, regardless because there are still a lot of things that I think it can optimize. And uh, I think uh, like our team is also working on just-in-time compilation in, in Ruby. And um, I think they've got some, mm -hmm. they've got some good results they're working I think that they're working towards uh, actually having it in Ruby, but um, I don't think it's anytime soon. Um, yeah, I mean, right now we already have MJIT uh, in Ruby, which which I believe JIT's a whole method. 
but I think that one doesn't have any tangible benefits in, in rails right now. Maybe I can say that most recent numbers on YJIT show a little bit of a performance improvement in the Rails benchmark. So, is it fingers. three three point one or like in the Ruby or some on the head? This, this, no. no, this is a a, a branch of Ruby hmm. that the team inside of Shopify is building a lighter weight JIT, uh, JIT inside. Um, it looks promising, but too early. Uh, so why did I decide to contribute to Ruby? Um, so long story, um, two years ago when I was an intern with Ufuk, uh, I worked on Sorbet and that kind of stuff. And uh, there before I left, I was like, next time I come back, I want something really challenging. And, uh, and he lived up to the promise. And I came back and I got something very challenging. And so that, that's, uh, that's how I started working on Ruby. Um, it's a, like, I'm not gonna lie, it's a very challenging code base. There's about 30 years of, of code in there and some of the quality is not great. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been working on various parts of Ruby and uh, cleaning things up when I think they're, they're not very good in some parts. And also I love Ruby. So, you know, developing the future of the, of the language that, that I love is, is a big honor for me. Did you meet with Matt? No, unfortunately, uh, I started um, working on Ruby actually, I think exact, almost exactly a year ago now. Uh, and that was already the start of COVID. So no, not yet but I am very much looking forward to it. Can you like, how does a language designer work when like that person got stuck? So when I have a problem, I can go to Google or like Stack Overflow. But in your case, I assume, like, do you ask a question that like, you're stuck in a sense of like C or, I don't know, just a brainstorming with other people? <laughs> You read a, uh, what is this, 500 page book about garbage oh, collectors yeah. and, and you hope this gives you some motivation on, uh, on how to get unstuck, uh, on how to develop certain features. Um, but you're right, it's, it's not easy. And there's, there's Stack Overflow helps very little. Um, so sometimes you, you have to read uh, university papers and that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, other languages internals. Um, yeah, I dug a little bit into how Python sort of works. Um, and um, actually I've read a lot of things in V8, which is the, the JavaScript engine inside uh, Chrome and they, they've written some very good stuff about how they're working on optimizing performance. Um, and so I, I actually highly recommend V8's blog if you wanna know more about how languages are implemented and optimized, uh, they've written some very good stuff there. I think about Crystal. What do I think about Crystal? I think the I think the syntax is nice. I think it has a lot of potential. Uh, but at the end of the day, 
what really matters is if it takes off, if there's a community that gets built around it. And uh, we don't know that yet, but I think it's a very promising language because it's, it's promising a very high performance where while still uh, being very similar to Ruby. It's comparing with Go language. Have you tried Go ever? A little bit, yeah. What do you think about it? I prefer object oriented. Yeah, it's it goes got its nice part. Um, if you're if you're into functional, I think it's pretty nice. But uh, I'm not a big fan of functional. Maybe because maybe because I've I've written too much C and now I get haunted by functional. <laughs> Do you graduate from Stanford? Am I right? No, no, no. Oh, sorry. No, I, I went to uh, I went to U of T, University of Toronto. Ah, sorry. Do you, which language did you learn in in school? C or other? Mostly it was in Python, oh. except for like the, um, the, the courses that require low level. For example, like if you're doing like a systems course, then, then it's written in C. But for most courses where it doesn't require low level, it's written in Python. I have a question uh, about liquid C. Is it totally yeah. safe to uh, switch from liquid Ruby to liquid C? So uh, it, liquid C doesn't replace liquid. What it does is it actually complements liquid and it, oh, okay. because it doesn't replace everything in C, it uh, replaces the, the, the most performance critical things in C. So what should be safe is you install both liquid and liquid C. And what liquid C will do is it will, um, at runtime, use, use Ruby features like metaprogramming and, uh, and, uh, and, and redefine methods mm -hmm. um, that are the highest, that are performance critical and then run, run C code for those instead of Ruby code. So, um, and, and if you run into problems, uh, please let us know um, where if, if there's a case where the Ruby version behaves differently than the C version. Um, it's something we're trying to, to make sure that they, the two behave the same. Okay, thanks. And Peter fixed many of the instances where they didn't behave the same. So it's safer now. Yes. Yeah. Is there a test suite that compares two implementations at the same time? Uh, so Liquid does have a test suite, um, but what I did is um, I used this tool called AFL or American Fuzzy Lop, which is a tool written by Google um, to actually find security problems inside of your code. And what I did is I had a script that runs. So, so AFL will give you input and um, as output, you tell it if, if it was good or if it crashed. Uh, and the, the, the point of AFL is to find an input that causes your code to crash. And so what I did is uh, when AFL gives me the input, uh, I'll run it against liquid Ruby and liquid C, and then compare the difference, uh, compare the two outputs. And if it's different, uh, I get the script to crash itself. And so that would give me the, the, the sets of input where liquid Ruby and liquid C produce, the diff produce different outputs. And AFL, uh, you can also feed it code coverage. And based off code coverage, it will find uh, it will generate inputs that it thinks will uh, increase code coverage. And that way we'll find a lot of corner cases very fast. But of course, that's still a lot of brute forcing. 
So I ran it for several hours on a 96 core machine on AWS. And it was able to find quite a few, uh, quite a few cases where the two implementations did behave differently and we, we fixed them accordingly. I think one of the easiest way to understand into a uh, test on a production environment. So probably clients will tell you if they see any difference on their websites. <laughs> so we're at the one hour mark. I think we can wrap up. So if the, anyone has a final question, maybe we can take the final question from Yashar. Yes, uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the final question, I guess. <laughs> so issue or feature. So we have like a roadmap of features that we wanna do, but in terms of bugs, um, you know, like, if it's if it's something that if it's a bug that that was caused by me, then I should fix it. Um, and if if it's something I think um, I can tackle, or uh, yeah, or like I think I'm I am well suited to to fix, and you submit to uh, the Ruby bug tracker, then 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 I'll I'll, I'll fix it. Um, yeah. But if it's like something like I have no idea what's going on, then I like I'll leave that to the to the other people who know better than I do. Did you share your setup uh, in anywhere in Twitter or Instagram? What kind of setup? Your like office setup, because I was I was seeing you looking at like top parts. Maybe you have some screens. I, I wondered like uh, how it looks like. Yeah. Um, I've got, oh, this is, sorry, give me one second. I need to undo some cable. <laughs> if you shared. Um, <laughs> so I've got, I've got my, uh, I've got my laptop here. And then I've got a I've got a curved ultra wide here, got a curved ultra wide, and then I have another monitor on top. So uh, oh. a lot of monitors. Yeah, I was just wondering because you were looking up. Yes. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Yeah, um, it's a lot of monitors. <laughs> yeah, I mean. If you if you're considering and you haven't gotten one, a curved ultra wide is great for writing code. I'll just say that. You said a touch two inch or touch four. It's a thirty four inch touch four. curved ultra wide. Yeah, it's a, it's great when you want to split and you have two two vertical panes. It's great. It's great. So, final questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think we already had final questions. Yes. Peter, is there anything you want to add or? Um... Oh, uh, thank you all for listening. Um, I, if you have any sort of feedback, uh, I, I'd love to know. Um, you can like email me uh, or uh, DM me on Twitter or something. And uh, so if you, if you had trouble following along, I'd love to know that as well. Uh, maybe I went too fast on certain parts. Maybe I didn't explain certain things well enough. I'd, I'd love to know because this is the first time I've given a talk. So really like to know if, if, if the pacing and everything and the content was, was good. But thank you very much all for listening. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave you guys back with your conversations. Have a good evening, everyone.
Thank you. Bye. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye. bye.